Hi, my name is Thomas Grumbucht. I'm here to um, talk a little bit about watercolor. So I thought I would um, show you guys some examples and, um, and work my way through a demo. So first there's a couple of, you know, set up for some paintings here that um, I thought I'd show you guys. Um, so it'll be similar to what I'll um, work on today um, in the demonstration. Uh, so this is usually how I would set up my um, watercolors for my illustrations. So I've just done, you know, this setup with some color pencils. And um, I usually pick a warm tone because it, it's easier to connect with the colors that I'll be using later on. And there's a, another one here. So it's kind of the same setup as I have um, for today's demo. Similar, similar thing. Um, and uh, occasionally I'll also work on on a tone surface. So it's kind of the same thing. You just uh, have to rely a little bit more on opaque paints as you um, you move towards the finish. And as for the for the finished painting, uh, you know, for me, it tends to look a little bit like this, where you can still see the drawing through, and the watercolor is more of a transparent um, layer that goes on top of the drawing that you should still be able to see uh, through towards the finish. So there's a few more of these here. And you can see uh, for quite a few of these, including the one that I'll um, show today in the demo I'll have uh, you know just the paper background so it makes it a little bit you know a little bit quicker for me to not have to deal with the big you know the big wet shapes as I as I paint so so this one has you know just a little bit more going on but it's kind of the same thing it's a lot of shape painting with um, you know some detail added in towards the end the big difference here is that I started out the um, the drawing with ink and not um, color pencil. So we got a, we got another one here. So, so what I what I tend to do is I'll paint the big shapes first, and then you know kind of move in towards the, you know, the smaller little sections as I as I go. So yeah, this one has a background. Um, it takes just a little bit longer. It's not um, really any more difficult. Um, it just, again, it's having the time to wait for you know this whole section to dry. So I'll um, you know I'll spare you guys that um, that waiting time today for the demonstration. So let me put this stuff this stuff aside. So this could be another you know just a reminder, I guess, to. Um, make sure that you that you know the palette that you work from um and i've, I've done a bunch of these i'd probably recommend it for you too if you haven't um as of yet so if you're starting with watercolor you want to try to familiarize yourself with uh, the paints the pigments that you're working with and they all have slightly different qualities um, so it might be a good idea to you know to set up a chart like this where you're basically just mixing the colors together um, again it's you know this is kind of a it's a simple exercise to do. It just takes a little bit of time and preparation. So, um, just you know, just a reminder: if you're working off a new set, that it's probably be pretty helpful for you to see what the pigments do. Some are strong and some are weak, uh, and they act in you know slightly different ways um, in terms of um, opacity. And um, some of them will give you a little bit of granulation, which is it's almost like. A sediment and and sand where you get a texture on the surface. And it'd be a little bit hard to um, hard to see that here, but you can see in these colors, you can kind of see both colors in the mix. So it'd be a good idea to try to explore that too. Um, and even do you know small little um, swatches where you could you could try out not just color combinations but you know how to draw certain things um like in a landscape you know it could be a little bit of um a little bit 
challenging to paint um, the sky, to paint skin tone. So I, I try to practice these things um, on the side and I usually have my students, you know, do the same, do the same thing. So you can see in this, it's just different, different types of sky color. Um, and I'm just, you know, kind of playing around with pigments, but um, you could put down keywords. It could be cloudy. It could be early morning, late evening. You, you could use reference for this, but maybe also, you know, just explore freely with the pigments. And of course, with something like this, there's no pressure. So um, it's good to practice a little bit before you get to that, you know, big, important finished piece. So this shows you how to, you know, mix in towards skin tone. And I'll, I'll try to show a little bit of that in the, the painting that I'll do today for you guys. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm taking these bright primary colors and mixing them together to get the skin tone. Because uh, my, my palette has, you know, for some people, maybe just uh, 9 to 12 colors. So you'll be doing a lot of mixing and, um, you know, diluting that pigment with water to get, you know, all the colors that you need in your painting. All right. So I'm going to put all that aside. So I'm going to start um, start painting this thing. I think what I'll what I'll do first is I'll uh, focus on the skin tone, which would be one of the more difficult things to, to deal with. Uh, and again, what I what I'd like to do in my painting is to um, start with the the bigger washes first, um, and that's where watercolor you know shines. I think it's the color combinations that you you get when you put water down and you let the pigments kind of move together. Um, and some of these pigments will naturally, you know, pull towards each other. And there's other pigments that do a little bit the opposite. And you can get certain effects that way. So I have, um, let's see, more than I need of brushes but you know I've, I've been painting for a long time so uh, I have more than than you would if you're starting out but if you can get a small side brush a medium size brush and something maybe a little bit bigger that you could use for the for the big washes you have enough to get started so keep it simple and I'd probably recommend you know starting with something fairly cheap like uh, a synthetic brush instead of the, the natural hair brushes. So this is a size, you know, size eight or so. Um, so I think I'll probably do most of my painting with this with this one brush. Um, and this is a synthetic brush, which is, you know, it's not that expensive. So before I start painting this, um, I have my, my palette over here on the side. I have my water um, bucket. Um, I also have a little spray bottle um, which I would use to to wet the paint before I get started um, so just a handy little thing to you know get your paint ready for a painting where you want it to be a little bit um, moist before dipping your brush into it if the paint is completely dry you gonna find yourself you know kind of stabbing at it and you know grinding into it with the brush um, as opposed to just you know easily lifting off the pigment so yeah use a spray bottle you could wet it with the brush too but then you're you know you're picking up color at the same time as you're you're wetting the paint so you could you know find yourself contaminating the the colors a little bit that way um, and then there's one more thing that i that i will need and that's some paper towels you could use um fabric as well but um i usually use like a like a thick paper towel so it absorbs pretty pretty quickly all right so i'm gonna mix mix a little bit of color so for mixing that skin tone again i'm gonna start with some some primary colors so i'll take a little bit of red a little bit of yellow and then I want something a little bit cooler than that so usually what I go for um, for the cool tone would be like a, a weak blue pigment just want to be careful that I don't pick um, 
a strong blue because it's going to take you know it's going to take over this is like a, a dark blue it's a Payne's gray so that probably wouldn't work there's a, a phthalo blue here as well and you can see how strong that pigment is if you start dropping that into skin tone it's going to completely take over so that's why you do the you know the chart that i talked about in the beginning so you can work on um subtle color transitions and temperature changes and uh you know based off the brand that you have um and the colors that you that you use and sometimes the difference between like artist grade paints and student grade paints you find that there's a lot of differences so explore your paints you know so you're you're ready once you um you do your actual illustration all right so i'm mixing these colors together and uh, as long as i can keep my paint wet um the paint is alive where i can keep modifying it and changing it and you know taking out pigment adding pigment um, so I'll just make sure that when I drop it down, like in, you can see here, I'm, I'm putting down a puddle basically where it's quite wet and I'd rather have it too wet than, than not enough. So I'm just going to start dropping that in. If I don't like it, I can change it. I just can't wait, you know, until it dries to do that because then it gets kind of blotchy. So you can see there's some big jumps in color early on here, but I'll just modify that, you know, let's make sure that I add enough water where I give myself extra time to explore the color and make adjustments to that color um, before, you know, before that wash actually dries. Um, and all you have to do if, um, if your wash is too wet is you can dry off your brush, you can dry it with that paper towel again, and you should be able to soak up that pigment pretty, pretty easily. So just make sure that you, you know, you don't wait so long that um, you start having to scrape it off the surface because then it will, you know, will get kind of, kind of blotchy. So I'm just going to cover that again. And I'll just fill in that, you know, fill in that whole shape. So it's not quite the color that I want yet, but, um, so at least a combination of um, warms and cools and um, and that's what you tend to always see within you know within that skin right it's uh, be warmer in certain areas and um, and within certain certain plane changes of um, of the head as well All right, so I'm gonna see if I can add just a little bit more color to this So that to me is just a little bit too yellow. So I'm going to try to change that before, before it starts settling on the surface. i try to move that a little bit towards like a pink tone. So another thing to remember here, and you guys will see that um, as this painting dries, these pretty strong colors that I'm putting down now, as they dry, they're going to they're going to fade and there's um, there's certain pigments that tend to fade a little bit more than others so within um, the reds and oranges and sometimes the browns you're going to have to put down colors that are probably a little bit brighter than what you would um, you would want in your finish so I'm going to try to do that here too a little bit of cool underneath that chin And this is still, you know, quite wet now, but um, what I can do is I can probably still keep modifying this, this wash. If I make the, make the paint drier and stickier, I should be able to fuse a darker color into the wash without having it, having it spread too much. 
So I think I'll probably try that up towards that that eye socket. And it's still, you know, still quite wet there. So you can see it pretty much just stays in place. It doesn't really move around that much. So this will save me a little bit of time later on and avoid having um, me having hard edges all over the place. So the hard edges come if you you wait for a shape to dry completely and then you put another you know shape next to it or on top of it. So if you want soft edges, you know you're gonna have to sometimes work with with that wet wash before before it dries. So the timing for that could be a little bit tricky, but um, I guess it's more complicated if you if you do a lot of painting outside. All right, I'm gonna add just a little bit more more warmth to this. So now I'm charging the color with more color, and this is again something that you can do while the the wash is wet. If you do um, put a big wash down and you're noticing that it's drying very quickly. What you can also do is use that spray bottle again. So you could um, kind of charge that wash with um, with a little bit of water and you know kind of bring it back to life again. You just got to make sure that you don't spray too heavily. And that's why it's you know it's quite helpful to have a spray bottle that just mists the surface. Um, and you can pick up those um, either at the art store or um, probably at, um, at a pharmacy or something like that. Maybe you already have a spray bottle at the home, um, at home. So either like a small spray bottle or an atomizer would be, would be good for this. All right, so that's a little bit within the head. I think I'll come back to that later. But as I have that skin tone and it's just, you know, just sitting on my palette, uh, I'll clean my palette while I'm painting, but I also like to keep these washes for, you know, so I could make sure that the color harmonizes through my painting. And obviously here, I want to make sure that the skin tone, you know, within the arm has still has something to do with uh, the skin tone within, within the head. It could be quite hard to mix that exactly the same way if you start from scratch. So I'll just try to save it. If it dries, you could just, on your palette, you just add more water to it. So, back here. All right, so I'm going to finish up um, putting in the skin tone where I can see it. So there's a little bit within the torso and a little bit down at the legs. And then um, we'll see if we can move on to, to another section. So yeah, if you're if you're changing the color, just make sure that you, if you just want a subtle temperature change, that you take care of it right away. If you wait too long, you're gonna find yourself with edge after edge after edge, and uh, it's gonna make for kind of a blotchy, a little bit hard to read painting. I think in the end. All right, so that's a starting point. Um, so it's not what I want in the finish. I think it's still probably too pale within um, the head, within the hands, but it's a base color. Uh, with watercolor, I tend to you know, prefer to start with the lighter values and then build up value as I go. Um, so you can be careful in, begin in the beginning. Just, you know, just remember again that the colors that seem bright um, they're going to lighten as the as the the pigments dry and the you know the water evaporates, um, and you should be able to see that in this too. So in a bit, I'll put down some dark values so you can see you know the value pattern that you actually have available. So it's a little bit of an issue with watercolor. You know, um, some are just kind of afraid of it because they think it's difficult, but. Um, I guess one of the, the bigger issues is that people are just too careful with the values and you end up with these kind of pastel-y, you know, soft things where you should be able to get the full, 
color and value range with watercolor, just like you would with any other um, any other paint. Um, so I guess the biggest difference is that you um, you don't really use white to lighten the color. Um, if you do, you make everything opaque. And if you make everything opaque, you also shift the temperature. Um, so when you add white, that red is going to you know shift towards kind of um, a cooler pink color. So you got to be a little bit careful. What you want to do is you want to lighten the values almost always with water as opposed to using white. Um, so I'll use white for certain techniques and to fix things, but um, I try not to rely on it early in the painting because then it basically turns into a gouache painting um, where you lose probably the best part of watercolor, which is that um, that luminosity where you can see all these, you know, these pigments kind of working together. All right. So I'm going to keep going. Uh, what you could do if you rush for time is that you could, you know, since I'm painting these these bigger shapes uh, one at a time and then modifying within that shape, I can keep going to other shapes that are not connected. But if I'm putting in, you know, the shape of the, the shirt or the shape of the pants, I got to make sure that the shape that sits up against it is is not wet, right? Because then it's going to start bleeding across. Um, but what I could do is I could paint this table. I can paint shapes over here. Um, I can start working on the chair that has a shape between, you know, the wet shape and the shape of the chair that sits below. So I'll try to be as efficient as I can. The other thing that you probably want to think about when you when you do a painting with uh, with a wet medium is where your hand is going on the paper. So I'm right-handed, so my hand sits over here. What I prefer to do is to do most of the painting that sits on the left side of the page first, and then the right side of the paint, you know, the page later, so I don't have to keep rubbing my hand across the page. And it's especially important if you, you know, set up your drawing with graphite, because you're going to start smearing that graphite all over the page. Um, and I guess, you know, worst case scenario, you put a wet, heavy, dark wash down and you pulled your hand across it and now your, you know, your painting is basically ruined. So you can lift things off if you make a mistake. Um, you can add a little bit of water and then soak it up either with, you know, a clean paper towel, not this one, <laughs> um, where you can take the pigment off. And some pigments will lift off almost completely and other ones will stain the paper so you you kind of have to um yeah you're gonna have to deal with it you might be able to change the background you might be able to edit it afterwards um and in some cases you're just gonna have to have to start over again so it's a good good way to learn i guess just not the most fun way to learn Let's see. I think I'll. Um, I think the shape of the torso is fairly dry, so maybe I'll put in the um, the shape of the pants that sit below. Let's see if I can mix a color for that. So maybe for the pants, I could use a paint that um, gives us just a little bit more texture. So I have a brown on my palette that um, it's almost like sand. So it's a uh, it's a pigment that's derived from um, from a stone that when you make it into a powder, it, it turns into the sediment. So when I put that down on paper, it's going to create this texture for me. Um, as opposed to something like gouache that, you know, would always lay down, you know, perfectly flat. It could look good, but it could, you know, it could be just a little bit, a little bit boring. So I'll just make sure that if I if I want that texture to appear, that I use a lot of water for this. If I want that um, that sediment to create that granula granulation, which is that the texture that comes from that pigment, I got to make sure that it's got some water, so it 
it's allowed to, you know, kind of move out and create um, texture within that wash. If it's too dry, it doesn't really do anything. Okay, so this is a mix of um, a couple of different pigments. So there's a little bit of blue in this, and there's a little bit of this um, brown that has that um, that granulating quality. So it's a little bit hard to see, you know, on this painting with the sheen, but once that dries a little bit. Um, We'll try to, you know, zoom in a little bit on that and um, we'll take a look at it. So if you do want more texture, you can also, at the art store, you can buy like a granulating um, medium. So you can add that in, but you know, it's just like another thing that you gotta remember to do and it's a little unpredictable. So I think yeah, you'd probably be better off just um, exploring the, the pigments that you have um and you know listening to people that have worked with it a little bit longer so you can save yourself um having to make all the same mistakes you know it, it does take a while if you don't have any have any help along the way so that's one of the things that i i tend to focus on in my i usually teach a watercolor technique class so i'll um do a lot of experiments and uh, you know just sharing information um, and we share you know the mistakes and the successes and um, we talk about different pigments and how they can blend together and do all these experiments so again once you get to your painting you have a lot more tools and options and we do talk about you know things like fixing mistakes too which is um, a big part of doing a painting like this you know there's a lot of unpredictable things happen along the way um, and again it is the beauty of watercolor that you know these textures appear these color combinations appear and sometimes you're in control and sometimes you just you know sometimes it just happens uh, so you can nudge it along the way but um, you know you generally also want to make sure that you allow your paint to you know, so surprise you a little bit, I guess, as you um, mix these different, you know, pigments together in different ways with different brushes. All right, so so that is the pants. Um, I think maybe I'll um, go back up to to that head again and add just a little bit more detail. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit flat and boring the way it is now. So what I'm doing with my hand when I'm touching it on the on the paper like this, I'm putting the back of my hand on the surface. And it's probably the easiest way to check to see if that wash is dry. So obviously if it has a sheen, like you can see down in the left corner, then you know don't touch it because you'll start smearing that paint and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna show in the finish. But if it seems dry and you're unsure, you know, you should be able to hold either the side or the back of your hand to it. If it's still cool to the touch, then there's still water in there and you, you might have things, you know, um, spread. And uh, it's, you get this like blossom effect, which can sometimes be um, a bit of a problem. <laughs> you can see my palette is kind of a little bit of a mess right now, but. Okay, if it's too, um, if it gets too busy with colors, um, I'll just clean it off with uh, with the paper towel. And again, you can use that spray bottle. So you can spray it and then, you know, quickly be able to lift off that pigment. So I'm trying to find a color that could work within the warmer parts of the face. Kind of a red tone and this is going to look like a bit of a mistake when you put it in you can see that it's going to just sits by itself that shape that i place on top but if you clean your brush a little bit and come in towards the edge you should be able to soften that edge so you basically lighten the pigment um, with water again 
so you can create gradients. So you can see I can now just kind of shift the color that I already have with the color that sits on top of it. And um, a lot easier to make those um, alterations with watercolor than um, I think with uh, acrylic um, gouache or oil, um, where you have to do more, you know, more careful mixing since those, you know, those pigments tend to be more opaque. Acrylic can be, you know, acrylic paint can be both. You can kind of act like watercolor and like oil paint. So we got a little bit more, you know, a little bit more color there. So I think I'll do the same thing with the shape of the hand. So the hands just tend to be a little bit warmer in temperature than, than the arms would be. So that could be a good thing to, um, to look into and you should be able to find that you know that information from a lot of sources but the body tends to be warmer and cooler in certain areas and everybody's a little bit different everybody has a slightly different you know, temperature and value to their skin but there's you know there's some things that we have in you know we tend to have in common so you get a lot of warmth around the middle part of the face you tend to get um a little bit more warmth at the joints and into the into the fingers and the and the feet. So those are the areas where you usually want to add just just a little bit more punch of punch of color. And maybe the warmest part of the face would be within that ear. So I'm gonna add a little bit more punch of color in that area. You got some uh, deeper recesses there. They tend to hold a lot, of, a lot of warmth, and sometimes you even see a little bit of warmth as a light, you know, passes through the the thinner parts of the ear. So it'd be nice to put in a little bit of punch of color early on, so you can see what your what your range actually is. So I'm gonna leave that. I'm gonna put some dark pigments in too. There's a small little shadow underneath the ear that could make the ear look a little bit more like it's sticking out from the shape of the head. I'm gonna put that in. And you can see once I put a dark pigment in, it makes, again, everything else appear just a little bit lighter. So I keep going, you know, I'm going back and forth. And uh, sometimes I miss a little bit with that, with that first wash. Um, hopefully I made it too light rather than too dark. So you can, you know, start layer, layering into it. If you do find yourself with a darker pigment than, than you wanted, again, you can go into a dark, you know, like, sorry, a, a dry wash as well and uh, lighten that. Um, but you're going to have to, you know, wet the shape and then with your brush, you know, lift off the pigment and dab it off with a paper towel. So it's a little unpredictable again where, you know, the one pigment might come off but not the other one. So... Something that you'll you know you'll have to explore. So putting in more shadow underneath that chin. And again, I have a big jump here from the shadow into the light. So I'm gonna clean my brush, dry it off a little bit, and just you know, just soften that edge. It's still, you know. The shape that I put down is still wet, so I can modify it. I can lift out the pigment too. Uh, if you put a little bit too much pigment down, you can take it off. You know, you just got to make sure that you do it again, preferably before you know before it dries. And then change that edge down there too. I missed a little bit here. You can see I'm working on um, working on a piece of paper, but it's actually a block of watercolor paint. 
So I can move that around and that will be um, quite important uh, for detail work because I might want to turn the whole page so I can put the brush up along the edge accurately. It's easier to have, you know, get good detail if the tip of your brush goes up along the edge as opposed to painting the opposite direction where your hand's going to be a little bit in the way. So for this demo, I'm kind of, you know, stuck with one direction, but usually I would keep turning this around. So it makes it a lot easier to pull long straight lines with your brush. Um, and then also makes it a lot easier to modify detail. So you just want to make sure that either you work off a block like this that keeps the paper flat, um, or you're going to have to stretch the paper um, where you wet the paper and put it on a stiff board. Because if not, it's going to start, start wrinkling. And um, you'll find yourself with big washes that start dipping into these um, these valleys, and um, you'll have you know your your wash be wet over here and dry over on the opposite side, and then you know um, the pigments just kind of you know do what they want to do, and um, you're not really in charge anymore. All right, I'm gonna put in a few more a few more dark accents. So for the skin to appear light again, I'm going to have to put darker shapes against it so we could see see the actual range. Some creases along the wrist. So the other thing that I do when I fix mistakes sometimes, if I can hit it right away, sometimes I'll just lift off a little bit of pigment with my fingers. Um, a little unpredictable, but I'll take off a little bit of the pigment and not all of it, uh, where the paper towel will probably take it all off. Okay, so now I got to be a little bit careful. So this shape is not completely dry yet. So putting the hand on top of it was, um, you know, I basically just forgot, but it's not the not the best move if you're unsure. So try to, you know, just try to keep track of things as you paint. And again, it will be easier if you start on one side and, you know, kind of move your way over so you don't, you don't touch the paper. The other thing that could um, happen sometimes is that you you have your palette on the side and you're bringing this like this strong color over to drop down into a wash and you drip on that page. It's a mistake, you know, sometimes a mistake that you can't really fix. Um, what some people do is they'll put a clean piece of, um, you know, thicker paper in the areas that are, that you're not working on. So you can keep those areas clean. Um, I don't do that partly because I move the paper around so much, but um, could be a could be a good option. All right, I'm gonna put that sweater down. I think the pants are dry enough. You know, we'll put that other big shape down so we can kind of start moving forward. So I'm gonna take a little bit of yellow ochre. Now I'm going to pick a couple of colors that, again, give me just a little bit of texture. So now I'm trying to pick it up, you know, pick up as much of that water as I can. So I load the brush, you know, as much as I possibly can. Might be better off using a brush that holds a little bit more water. So there's two brushes here. They're about the same size, uh, but one is synthetic and the other one is a natural hairbrush. So you'll find that this natural hairbrush holds you know, a lot more water than the synthetic brush does. So maybe I'll we'll use that for the rest of this wash. Just can do it a little bit quicker and um, and hopefully put the wash down before before any part of it dries because then it will be blotchy again. 
Okay, so here I made a little mistake. It dripped a little bit. Um, so I just immediately went in with the paper towel and pulled that out. Okay. So if you do want that, um, if you are putting a really big wash down and you want to try to control how fast it dries, the other thing that you could do that is it's a little bit hard to do for me to do now is to angle the paper so you can put the wash down you know from the top and kind of you know work your way down the page so you let gravity you know do a little bit of the work for you then so it's a great way to put in a big background you know you, you put the paper at um i don't know 30 40 degrees or something like that you just angle it um so the water starts seeping down and you should be able to put in, you know, clean gradients that way. And, uh, and also, you know, just give yourself just a little bit more time for putting in big washes. So I'm trying to keep this wet enough where I can make some, um, some changes before it, before it dries on me. Because this is all, you know, pretty much the same color all the way through. So I'm going to try to make sure that it's a little bit more interesting. So this is what I could um, what I could do then. If I want the pigment to move around, I'll just move the paper around. And it's like a puddle sitting on that paper, so I can direct the water that way. Um, so if I find that it's kind of wet on one side and drying on the other, I can control that. Um, it could be a good way also to take up that extra water if it's a little bit too wet. And maybe we'll um, we'll try to do that with this with this wash. So a lot of these things would be second nature once you get used to it. You know, it's gonna be a little bit. It's a lot of things to think about right in the beginning. Okay, so I'm putting some other colors down. So while I'm doing that, I'm also adding a lot more water. So I might in this wash have to come in and you know help it dry a little bit by taking out all that extra water. If you leave too much water on the, you know, within that wash, you're also gonna have an issue with the drying in one area and not another. Um, which will create these uh, these backgrounds again that we talked about um, when working within the head. So the background was when the wet shape started leaking into the, the shape that dried, or the section of that same shape that dried, um, you know, next to it. Okay, so I'll probably start shifting that around a little bit. So I just put my brush down, I'm going to grab the paper, I'm just gonna let that pigment just kind of shift around in that surface. So just you know, kind of directing it around. I'm letting it do what it wants to do, but giving it just a little bit of a little bit of help. I'm going to pick up some strong pigment and actually go up along the edges a little bit. So you can get, um, since this shape is still wet, you can give it, you know, these kind of burnt colorful edges by coming up along the edge before it dries. So I'm trying to do that here. So it could be a good way to define the edge a little bit extra. And also, you know, just add a little bit of color interest towards the edge, edge of the shape or to turn the form. So by having it darker along the edges, it makes it look a little bit more like there's volume within the shape. Okay, so now I think I'll pull out a little bit of the, this extra water because it's going to take forever to dry. So this is when you, you, you do have to be just a little bit careful, especially with the pigment like this that creates that texture for me. If I start digging into that, you know, it's like sand settling um, 
in water, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show. So I wanted to try to leave it alone as much as I can. So I'd be better off if I can direct the water towards the edges and use that drying brush to pull that, you know, water out again. So I, I took a little bit of time, uh, let that wash dry. So we got rid of some of the sheen that was sitting on this side of the paper. So that big wash is still wet, but um, try to let that dry a little bit longer and then we'll modify that with a few, you know, a few dark shapes. Um, so it's a little bit time consuming in the beginning. It, it tends to speed up a little bit for me once I get the bigger washes taken care of because I don't have to wait for things to dry anymore. Um, and I can kind of just keep working on the detail. So it's detail that takes a little bit of time, but I don't have to wait for anything. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll put in a, a couple more, a couple more shapes. Um, and then I'll explain the next steps. Um, and, um, I'll show you what the, what the finish looks like and kind of talk your way, you know, talk my way through, um, through a little bit of that, that process. Okay. So I'm going to put in, um, a couple more things within the face, um, a little bit of texture maybe, and some detail. And then I'll think I'll paint in part of that table. Uh, so you can see me lay in a wash that um, has a slightly different quality than the ones that I've used so far. Um, and then, yeah, I'll explain what uh, what comes next. So let me get my, my brush again. So for something like this, I can usually get the painting done in probably in a day. Um, but it'd be even better for me if I could finish the painting and then put it aside for maybe a day or maybe even skip a day and then come back in and actually get a, you know, get a more objective look at it. And sometimes it's hard to catch everything in one, in one sitting. Okay, so I'm going to add um, just a little bit more color to to parts of the face. It looks a little bit flat still. Add a little bit of hair texture. The little hair he has. So again, if I'm going to put texture in, what I what I could do with my brush is I could kind of spread it out a little bit. So if you take the brush and you kind of push towards the end, or push it down towards your palette, and then kind of keep turning it, you could fan that out where that texture could actually be used within your within your painting. It's a little bit hard to see these small detail details, but basically put in ten thin strokes at one time instead of you know doing it one at a time. And it tends to work a little bit better for something like hair because you have sections that do the same thing within the hair anyways. So it actually look better than if you try to you know paint things one at a time. So it's kind of like a it's like a hatching technique, I guess, where the texture of the of the brush will help you a little bit with, um, you know, speeding up the, the details. So another thing that you could do if you um, if you do want thin lines and you find it hard to get with your with your brushes is that you can go back to to the color pencil and um, and add thin lines in with that. So it's a watercolor, but you know, that doesn't mean that you can't apply other mediums to it. So you'll find people that um, probably disagree with that, where if it's a watercolor, then you have to f follow certain rules. But um, 
As an illustrator, it's really the finish that is important and not so much, um, you know, the rules that you follow to get there. So I kind of just, you know, I use what I, what I know is going to work. So if that means using a little bit of white, uh, using other mediums, sometimes I'll, you know, use a gel pen. It's not, maybe not archival, but it's for a book illustration that doesn't always matter that much. So I'll use that to get my, my white light in instead of, you know, using the opaque white watercolor then. And sometimes I'll mix gouache uh, with the watercolor as well, which is basically the same thing, but gouache is obviously opaque and the you know watercolor tends to be a little bit more transparent. But that also depends on the pigment. So if you look at the tubes, it'll tell you if it's opaque or more transparent, it should. So I'm putting a few more dark accents into the pants that look quite, quite flat, actually. So you can see once the first uh, wash is laid in, it's pretty quick, you know, um, getting it towards something that looks quite finished. Clean up the edges a little bit. I guess there's another pant leg back here. Put that in. And then I think I'll go ahead and um, put in the shape of that table. Okay, so we need a bigger brush. So I think we'll take this natural hair brush again. So this brush um, is called the mop brush, and it, it basically acts like like a mop. It picks up a lot of water, um, but it's quite it's quite soft. So you you know you can push it around on the surface and uh, cover big areas, um, but it doesn't really bounce back in position again like the um, the sable brushes do, and also like most of the synthetic brushes will. So you use it for for covering big areas, and if you're painting detail with it, you can kind of shape it a little bit, but um, it's really, you know, has a certain, a certain use, you know, I'll show you when I, when I put the wash in. Okay, so I'm picking up a pretty, pretty strong brown pigment. This is a, like a transparent, um, red oxide or like a burnt sienna color. So picking that up pretty heavy. So now that I'm loading the brush with, with water using this brush, you should be able to see that I can cover, you know, cover bigger areas than I could before with the other ones that I use. So when I put that down, I'll probably cover the entire thing. And I know again that this is a color that um, has a tendency to fade a little bit. So I put this down as bold as I can. Save myself a little bit of time. Sometimes lose a little bit of the texture and uh, the luminosity when you put too many layers down. So the goal tends to be for work like this, that you you know you try to get as close as you can to what you want for the finish. Depends on the work, you know. Uh, there are ways where you can build up luminosity if you're very careful with the color choices um, by doing glazing, which is working um, with a lot of layers, you know, that are very transparent. You just got to make sure that if you work that way that you you choose pigments that are not opaque 
and that you don't start adding in colors that um, make that wash you know less vibrant and that can you know can happen very easily okay so that's almost a big shape Let me see. And if this brush, you know, if it feels clumsy as you go into the details of this, you can you can switch. So you can start using a brush that has, um, you know, a finer point. So I could do that here so I can show you guys. So I'm trying to pay attention to the direction of the strokes here too. So this is meant to be a wood, so I'm gonna try to follow the direction of the wood grain, right, that I'll probably add in later on. All right, so I'm going to put that brush aside and then pick up um, a thinner brush. So if I could just load that thinner brush with the same pigment and the same amount of water, I should be able to go into that same, that same wash. You can see this is a little bit easier to control if you want to clean up those, clean up those edges. This is also where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty glad here that I picked a warm brown tone to start with, because so I can actually make changes to um, to my drawing, you know, as I as I do the watercolor. So maybe we can add a little bit of depth while we're at it. So this shape is still wet. So this should, you know, eventually just kind of fuse together and give a sense of where these di different segments are. I'll probably give that just a little bit more punch later on. Save me some time. This is a pretty big wash, so I'll make sure that for this wash as well that I I try to make sure that everything is um, equally wet all the way through, so I don't have that that wet section again bleed into the other. Uh, and this might also be a good time since I'm working with fairly straight lines here to turn the paper a little bit, you know, just to make sure that things are not lopsided. So it looks like the you know the table tilts you know tilts a little bit. It's a bit hard to see from this angle, but I feel like it needs to, you know, move up a little bit towards the back. So the best way for me to adjust that would be to turn the page so I could see it along the line and, um, and make some changes that way. All right. So I think that's, you know, it's pretty much the process. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, finish up this painting, which will take me a little bit of time, add in some detail, um, and uh, when that is done, I'll, um, I'll try to explain step by step how that, um, how that process goes. So I've gone ahead and finished the, the painting. So I filled in the rest of the shapes and um, started adding in some detail. Um, the background was, you know, the pictures on the wall were done last, I think. Um, so for the very thin lines that you see in the pattern of the shirt, I used a little bit of color pencil and uh, also for some other line work. Uh, and I just picked the colors that were appropriate for that. And then it's just, you know, taking your time and um, carefully solving those small, small details, I guess, uh, with reference if needed. Um, and um, there's probably a few more things I could do with this, a little bit of texture in the wood, maybe some more detail um, within the face, um, 
but I'd probably put it aside for a day or two and then take a look at it. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, watercolor from start to finish then. Thank you.